If you have your Bible with you, I'd like for you to open it to the book of Luke, the 19th chapter. Luke chapter 19. I actually preached from this chapter talking about Zacchaeus just recently, but I want to read this, and today I want to talk about the righteousness issue. That's what I've titled this, the righteousness issue, and I I particularly enjoyed Kathy's illustration about the mess, but what it is and what, what you do, it just goes along with what I'm wanting to kind of say today in my way, but it begins in verse 1, then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho, now behold there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector and he was rich, two reasons to hate him right there, for most people. and he sought to see who Jesus was but could not because of the crowd. So he was, for he was like me. So he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste, come down, for today I must stay at your house. So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. But when they saw it, they all complained, saying, He has gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner, who is a mess, who is not right. Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor, and if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. Jesus came in to his house and immediately there's something changed. Do you understand that? You see that? Verse 9, and when Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because he also is a son of Abraham. For the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Now as they heard these things, he spoke another parable because he was near Jerusalem and because they thought, they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. Well, there's several things that I could say here, but one of the things I want to kind of get across to us is that immediately when Christ spoke to Zacchaeus and he went up in the tree and he came down, he was not liked by the people around him and the people didn't understand what uh, Jesus was doing They didn't understand. They thought that when Jesus came preaching and John the Baptist came preaching that the kingdom of God was at hand. They were looking for a literal kingdom. They thought that King Jesus was going to set, come and establish at this time an earthly king. There were those who didn't really believe that he was the Messiah because he didn't come and do what many of the people who had religious beliefs and context had in mind that he would do when he came at this time. But in this particular instance, I want you to realize that when, when Jesus came to Zacchaeus and he said to him, I'm coming to your house immediately. Immediately when Christ came in, there was a change that took place in the heart of Zacchaeus. In other words, there was something that happened, happened when Christ came to dwell in his house. Now, I'm saying it that way because... I personally believe that it is the abiding presence of Jesus living in the house that you now are, the house you are, Jesus living in our house where we are, this earthly tabernacle where we dwell, that makes us different than we were before Christ came to take up residence on the inside of us. Now... Here's what I want you to understand. When Christ came and you invited him into your heart, you received something from the Lord that is eternal. He chose to come just like he chose and called Zacchaeus. 
he chose to go to Zacchaeus' house that day. And if you receive an inheritance, how many of you understand if you receive an inheritance, you receive something that you didn't earn? You didn't earn your inheritance. Your inheritance is something you receive that's a gift. It's something that is given to you. Now, here in verse 9 through 11 here, he's, he's talking and he said, Today, he said to Zacchaeus, Today salvation has come to this house. He goes on, because he's a son of Abraham, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Now, as they heard these things, he spoke another parable because he was near Jerusalem and because they thought, they thought the kingdom of God would come immediately. Now, over in the Gospel of John, John's Gospel, the 18th chapter, John chapter 18, verse 36, Jesus said, Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Now, here's what I want you to notice in this verse before I go to the next one. is He says, my kingdom is not from here. Can you say from? Now watch. Pilate therefore said to him, are you a king then? Jesus answered, you say rightly that I am a king, for this cause I was born. Now you've got to understand, they thought Jesus was coming to establish his kingdom on the earth and that he would be the king. Pilate and the, the, the people were afraid. That's what they thought. I just read to you when, in his dealing with Zacchaeus. And he says, you rightly say that I am a king, for this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who, was, who is of the truth hears my voice. Now here's what I want you to see. Jesus said, my kingdom is not from this world. He did not say, he did not say that his kingdom was not for this world. I'm making the emphasis because I want you to see his kingdom was for this world, but it wasn't from this world. You remember how he told his disciples, here's how I want you to pray. He said, I want you to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now I'm saying that, and I want you to see this to try to set the stage. When he said, it is not of this world, it is not from this world. In other words, he's saying its source is not from here, it's from above. The source is from above. Now, as I've already told you, I want to talk today about the righteousness issue. I'm saying this because I want you to understand that the Scripture is clear that the kingdom of God that he's talking about, the kingdom is not meat or drink. The kingdom is righteousness, peace, and joy. Say righteousness, peace, and joy with me. Say righteousness, peace, and joy. So the kingdom of God, it's not meat, it's not drink, it's not of this world, it's for this world, it's not of this world, but the first dimension of what the kingdom is when he says the kingdom is righteousness, peace, and joy. If you seek first the kingdom of God, and we've heard this, we've preached it, and we understand, if we seek first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness and his righteousness, all these things, he says, will be added to you. How many of you know we get caught up seeking things? And I'm not necessarily saying bad things. We get 
to looking for things. Money, jobs, healing. We, we, we look for things. And I'm not, it can be good things. We can search after good things. But he said to first seek the kingdom of God. And we know that the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. And we know that the kingdom of God is not from this world. Jesus came preaching and saying that the kingdom of God is at hand. And if we seek first the kingdom, then it says all things else will be added. So the first issue, the first thing that me must be settled in our hearts is this issue of righteousness. Let me ask you this question. How many of you have accepted and invited Jesus Christ into your heart? Can I see your hand? Almost everybody here has invited Jesus. When he came, he brought his kingdom, which was righteousness, peace, and joy. If you're looking for righteousness here and in your strength, you're probably not going to find it. If you're looking for peace here and in your ability to create peace, you're probably not going to find it. If you're searching after joy in your ability to produce and know joy, you're probably not going to find it. One of the things that I want to try to settle, if I can, in dealing with this right up front, this righteousness issue, is do you all remember um, how, how they would take the rabbit and I don't remember where I saw this, but it was one of the things the rabbit had a thing around his neck and on his head and it had a, a, a chain coming out or something coming out. And, and there was a carrot out here in front, and, and he was chasing after the carrot. Y'all y'all ever seen that in cartoons or anything going, y'all know what I'm talking about? <clears throat> See, one of the things that I think we do is we dangle righteousness out here in front of us as something that we're trying to go after in our own strength. And as we run towards it in our own power, in our own strength, it stays the same distance in front of us no matter how fast we run. Because we set it as something out here that's in front of us that we go after. One of the things that we have also is a postponement mentality that we look at people and we say, you know, one of these days you'll be righteous. One of these days you'll mature enough that you'll, you'll, you'll have it together, you'll get your act together and you'll be in right standing with God. We've developed what I would call in the church a one of these days paradigm. You know, we sing songs like when we all get to heaven. And we have a mindset that's rampant in the church that just says, you know, we can't expect, we can't expect to ever be righteous as long as we're here in this flesh. We can't expect our lives to be what they need to be as long as I'm in this sinful body that I'm in. And we think one of these days in the sweet by and by when we all get to heaven, then and then alone will I be righteous. So today in trying to deal with this righteousness issue, I want to ask the question, well, how does somebody get righteous? When does righteousness come. Let me ask you a question. If you buy a car that has, already has air conditioning, power seats, power windows, <coughs> cruise control, that's all I can think of right this moment, but if it already has that, and you get a car, how do you think the guy at the dealership would respond if you came in and said to him, you know, this is a really nice car. I was wondering, could you put power windows, power door locks, 
air conditioning on my car. What would the guy look at you and think? What would he say? Huh? It's already there. How do I get righteous? I get righteous by accepting Jesus Christ into my heart and into my life. And when Jesus comes into my heart, guess what happens? I'm righteous. It's called grace. I'm righteous. I can tell by the look on some of your face. You don't believe me. It's all right. You've been wrong before. <laughs> Follow me just a moment. See, one of the things that we've done that I think is a horrible mistake is to put everything that we get from God into a future context. Into saying one of these days... I'll be mature. One of these days I'll have, when we get to heaven, when I leave this body, when, when I come in, one of these days things are going to be better. You know, it amazes me how many Christians think that the blessings of the kingdom of God can only be found when you get to heaven. John the Baptist, before Jesus came, who paved the way for Jesus, John the Baptist came preaching the kingdom of God is at hand. And he recognized and realized that this Jesus of Nazareth came. And Jesus, when he came, not only preached that the kingdom of God is at hand, Jesus preached that the kingdom of God is within you. Now listen to me say this. On the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came, Jesus said, I have to go. It's expedient for you that I go away, for if I go not away, the Comforter will not come, but when I go, he will come. He told the disciples, tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem till you be endued with power from not across the street, not from somebody else, from on high, talking about there's power that's going to come and my spirit, I am with you now, but I can only be in one place at one time because I took on a human body, but my spirit is going to come and he's going to fill every one of you and he's going to take up his place of residence on the inside of you and the righteous one is going to live inside of every one of us. When we accept Christ as our Savior, Jesus comes to live within us. Jesus declared the kingdom of God is within you. Do you realize that nobody under the old covenant, say old covenant, nobody under the old covenant ever qualified as being righteous. They never qualified as being righteous. There's a distinction, and I've made this numerous times, and I would think that this is knowledgeable to you. Jesus went and even preached to the Old Testament saints, and they, they, were, they accepted salvation, but they weren't born again because you couldn't be born again until the Spirit of God came to dwell on the inside of you. That's what the term, that's what we're talking about when we say born again. But the Old Covenant makes this declaration, there is none righteous, no, not one. That's Old Covenant. But the good news is, the good news in the new covenant, our new covenant righteousness is not based on performance, it is a gift. It is a gift. In Romans, Romans chapter 5, Romans 5, verse 17 says for if by one man's offense death reigned through the one 
much more those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. Now I want you to catch what this verse is saying to you. What Adam did, one man's offense, death reigned through that one. But much more those who receive. Now I ask you a question, let me ask you again, how many of you have received Jesus Christ? Those who have received Jesus Christ have received an abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness. It's something you receive. It's based on a gift you did not earn it. Now, hear me, it was freely given to you by grace. Let me just ask you, what is a gift? If I give you something because I want to give you something, what did you do to get it? Well, let me ask you this. What part of gift do you not understand? A gift is something that is given to you. A gift We keep, we keep trying to earn what has been freely given to us by grace. When you receive Christ, you receive not only grace, not only mercy, you receive the gift of righteousness. So, how do I become righteous? I become righteous by receiving Jesus Christ. Because what God is looking for is not my righteousness anyway. He's looking for me to have righteousness. And the righteousness I have is the gift that comes from God. Help me, Lord. In 2 Corinthians, the 5th chapter, 2 Corinthians... Chapter 5, verse 21 says, For he, God, made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Do you all believe that verse? Do you believe that verse? He, God, made him, Jesus, to become sin. He who absolutely did nothing wrong was made to be sin for us. So that, this was so that, I who absolutely could do nothing right could be made righteous through the sacrificial death of Jesus. You all realize we can talk about what a mess people are? And you can focus on what people are on the outside? And you can look for the things that's wrong with people in their flesh, in how they were raised or what's going on or what they think they are? You can look at them according to the outward man but if you understand that if you receive Jesus, you are the righteousness of God. Let me just tell you this about Zacchaeus. Somewhere between the lowest limb on that tree and the ground, Zacchaeus accepted Jesus into his heart. The rich young ruler, I talked about that a few weeks ago, came and says, what must I do? 
to be saved. See, he was coming from an old covenant mindset. I got to do something to have Christ. I got to be a certain way. And Jesus said, well, if you want to come at me from that way, then you got to sell all that you have and give to the poor. They said, well, how's anybody going to get in? See, because they, they didn't see. But all of a sudden with Zacchaeus, he didn't even, he, did, he didn't ask. What it? All Zacchaeus did, you know, how, how many of you understand he didn't give an altar call and have a sinner's prayer with Zacchaeus? Jesus didn't kneel down there and say, will not you kneel down with me and let me lead you in a sinner's prayer. Somewhere Christ spoke to him and he received him. And he said, Jesus said, today salvation has come into your heart. Now listen to me. Because of the grace and the gift of righteousness to us, because we have been given God's grace with Jesus and righteousness. We are now qualified to receive all of the gifts that the kingdom of God has in store for us. And you receive them because of Jesus and you are righteous because he's righteous. It's his righteousness that we have received. And I'm going to tell you, we can reign in life now. Jesus living on the inside of you has given you the power over sin Sickness and disease. I could read you verse after verse after verse talking about the power and the authority that we have over all power of the enemy. You know, I go around so many Christians who preach a great big devil and a wee little Jesus. Oh man, they want to talk about how big the devil is, all the stuff the devil can do. Oh, come magnify the devil with me. They talk about, oh, the devil can do this and the devil can do that. I tell you what, I can't, I can't conquer this, I can't conquer that. Well, listen to me. I want to tell you something. I believe in a great big God, a great big Jesus, and a wee little devil. <laughs> Quit magnifying the devil. Quit talking about what all the devil can do. Why don't you start talking about what Jesus can do? What can Jesus do with a heart that will believe? He said, all things are possible to him who believes. Well, if you believe there's a great big devil, what, what do you believe in? Help me, Lord. I hear Christians say all the time, one of these days, one of these days, I'll rule and reign with Jesus. Why don't you start now? Huh? I personally believe that the scripture declares that we are ruling and reigning with him now on this earth. I personally believe that we are the body of Christ on the earth. I now believe that the body of Christ is alive. I now personally believe that the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, lives on the inside of believers and that we have the ability to overcome sin, sickness, disease, and all power of the enemy. I I happen to believe that that's what God's Word teaches. Well, Pastor, I know that's what you believe. But I think I identify with those people who was looking at Zacchaeus. All I can see is the bad in him, what's wrong with him, and all of the things he can't do. And you want to act like that Jesus really comes and takes up his residence in sinners? How else do you get saved? Do you know how many people have the theology that they got to straighten up their life before they can come to church? 
I want to look at him and say, good luck. I've been going to church all my life and I still ain't got everything straight. I got people who encourage me and, and strengthen me and help me. And we, we, I, I, but I still don't have it the way I think it should be. I'm not dependent on my thoughts of how it should be. I'm dependent on Jesus. How, how do you get saved? How do you get saved? How do you get born again? You accept Jesus. The answer to everything I'm getting ready to ask you is accept Jesus, so you all know. How do you get saved? How do you get born again? How do you get healed? How do you get delivered? It's a finished work. Jesus has conquered death, hell, and the grave. Well, I don't see it. Nope. Some people don't because you know what they're looking for? What's wrong with you, not what's right with you. I'm righteous. You're righteous. Let me settle the righteous issue right now. I want you to look at somebody, two or three people around you and say, Hello, righteous. Hmm. What are you saying? Listen to me, guys. We've got to settle the righteousness issue. If you have accepted Jesus Christ into your life, you are at this very moment in right standing with God. And nothing can stop you from being in right standing with God. Quit trying to make righteousness something you do and start believing it's something you have. Well, I can't roll down that window and lock that door over there because I don't have power windows. I didn't have it put on this car. Well, Dodo, it was there when you got it. I say that because the church truck don't have power door locks or power windows. It's got a crank window. I go out there and get in that truck and somebody wants to come and get in the passenger door and the passenger door is locked. I have to put it in park and take my seat belt off because I ain't long enough to reach over and unlock it. <laughs> And I'm thinking, hmm, I like just sitting here going, you understand that? Let me help you get righteous. <clears throat> can, I, can I tell you something? The war is over. Jesus made peace with you and God through the blood of His cross. The blood of Jesus. Listen to me. The blood of Jesus made you righteous, put you at peace with God, and if that doesn't bring you joy, nothing on this planet will. I don't know how we say it. If you don't have a consciousness that you are loved by God just the way you are, how, how, how explain to me how you can look at somebody who is a murderer, a liar, a, a thief, a, a, a sinner of any way, shape, form, or fashion, and you can look at them and tell them that God loves them and died for them, but you look at somebody who's trying to walk out their Christian faith with God and look at them and say, oh, if you do this, 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 and this, you're going to hell. 
Explain that theology to me. Faith works by love. The more you realize you are loved, the more your faith is going to grow. Look at Romans chapter 8 with me. Romans 8, verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He, God, who did not spare His own Son, but delivered Him up for us all, how shall He not with Him also give us power door locks, electric bake, power steering, cruise control? Y'all understand? All things. All of the benefits come with Jesus. How shall he not freely give us all things? In other words, what this is saying is, if God loved me so much that he didn't even hold back his only son, what makes me think he would hold back healing, blessing, and prosperity? He was willing to send his... Jesus took a beating for your healing. Not so you get healed when you go to heaven. Healing healing has got nothing to do. Healing our physical bodies has got nothing to do with heaven. Pastor, why are we so sick? Uh, I don't know. I can't explain it all. I'm trying to understand. Help me, Lord. Let me read you a couple verses. Galatians chapter 3, verse 27 says, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Let me ask you a question. What are you wearing this week? What are you going to put on? Put on Christ. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Look at Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4 and verse 24 says, And that you put on the new man which was created according to God. Look at me. You are a new creation of beings that never existed before on the planet. Nowhere in the old covenant did the Spirit of God come to live. He come upon people, but He never come and took up His residence on the inside of anybody. But you and I are a new creation. We've put on Christ. We are new creatures in Christ. And what's incredible to me is that this has been divinely supplied. When Christ comes to live inside of us, now I have a new life. I have a new nature. I believe I even have a new DNA. Christ lives in me. The kingdom of God is within us. Listen to me say this, one of the greatest differences between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant is the fact that God would visit people under the Old Covenant. His dwelling places were physical, natural tabernacles or temples. In the New Covenant, the temple of God is no longer in a building, it's in people. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16 says, do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Over in John chapter 6, 
John, the sixth chapter, verse 48, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Now remember Jesus said, I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. Today I'm trying to settle the righteousness issue. You've got to understand that you are a child of God. You are in the family of God. You may not be as mature as you would like to be. You may not be as accomplished as you would like to be. But you are a child of God. You are the righteousness of God. You can put on Christ. Jesus came and placed his kingdom within you. His righteousness, His peace, His joy. Now He says, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven that one may eat of it and not die. Now remember, He said, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate this in the old covenant in the wilderness, they died. I'm going to give you something that you won't die. Watch. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore quarreled among themselves, saying, How can this man give us flesh to eat? Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say, Here's what he said to him: Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Now watch. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in them. Please listen to me say this to you. Our worthiness is not based on our performance. I'm not worthy to be a child of God because I perform like one. My worthiness to be a child of God is based upon His redemptive work. In other words, I'm not righteous. I'm not worthy because of what I've done. I'm worthy. I am righteous because of what He has done. Now listen to me say this. When I discern the Lord's body, I discover that his shed blood and his broken body is what qualifies me to receive eternal life. Did you read that? He that eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. Receiving Jesus is what makes me fit for him to live in. He comes in, I'm fit. In just a few moments, we're going to pass out some communion elements that we use. A little bit of grape juice, fruit of the vine. A little bit of bread that represents the body that was broken for us. The blood that was shed for us. And uh, when I discern the Lord's body. I discern his shed blood, his broken body, and that's what qualifies you and I to receive eternal life. I grew up in a church that before they would have communion, they would read from Corinthians, and they would talk about you better make sure you're right with God before you receive this. They would go into great depth and great detail about if you're not right and something's wrong with you and you receive the blood and the body of Jesus, 
you could get sick or even die. I've been in services where they would have an altar call for an hour before they would give communion. Haven't you, Lou? Yep, hear my heart and hear where I'm at. Am I worthy to receive communion or does receiving communion make me worthy? It's kind of like a doctor saying, if you weren't sick, I could give you a medication that would fix you. He didn't look at Zacchaeus and say, if you'd get right with me, I'd come to your house. He just looked at Zacchaeus and said, hey, come down, I'm going to your house. Listen to me. If I'm already healed, I don't need the medication. But if I'm sick, the medication can heal me. Are you listening to me? So, ain't one of you in any kind of a condition in your own strength, in your own ability, in your own fitness to receive the broken body of Jesus. But Jesus said, they thought, see, they thought he was talking about cannibalism. Do you understand that? When you read this whole context of John 6, you really, they thought he was talking about how are we going to eat his blood and drink his flesh. They didn't understand. Just like they didn't understand what happened to Zacchaeus, just like they didn't understand the kingdom of God is spiritual, not physical. He was not coming to be a physical king. Listen to me. Jesus Christ should be the king of your heart this moment. Why? Because the kingdom is within you and the king wants to rule your life. I preached this just a few weeks ago. We ought to get out of the way and let the king rule. Now listen to me. You can't make demands before we give the supply. If we're already perfect before we partake of the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus, then what do we need to partake of it? But here's what I think he's trying to get us to see. We've been predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. And I believe when we take the cup and we take the bread, he's trying to get us to see he wants to come in and be a part of who we are. He's the bread we need to eat. He's the cup that we need to partake of. I don't receive communion because I am right. But it sure helps me understand how to be right. Lord, as we prepare to receive your body and your bread, your blood. I thank you now, Lord, that as we receive this into our hearts, into our bodies, into our minds, that we realize we are right because of you. And as we take this physical bread and this physical juice, into our lives, may we have a greater recognition, a greater realization, and a greater understanding what you are doing in our lives. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your body that was broken for us, for your blood that was shed for us, and for your life that you gave that we might have everlasting life. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name.